Around the turn of the 20th century, Sigmund Freud revolutionized psychology with his description of the talking cure, a method of therapy premised on the idea that the path to healing lay through the human voice. Although many of Freud's ideas have fallen into disrepute, his central idea that the act of talking about oneself can help people to understand themselves better and even, in some cases, to conquer their fixations and fears, remains an enduring, if often uncredited, legacy of the founder of psychoanalysis. The idea is so simple that it is difficult to realize how revolutionary it is. When people narrate their thoughts, feelings, and memories to someone else, they naturally begin to remember details that they didn't know that they remembered, they begin to recognize connections that they had not perceived before among disparate events, and they achieve a deeper understanding of how their own brain stores, processes, and retrieves information about the world. Flash forward a hundred years and you can see the talking cure being practiced everywhere you go in the confessional memoir section of your local bookstore, in the news where a disgraced politician or religious leader tells his story in the hope of redemption, and of course, on television, where everyone goes to sell their dirty laundry in exchange for five minutes of fame. Oprah Winfrey is the high priestess of the postmodern form of Freud's talking cure, the kind that trades a couch in a European office for a lavalier microphone in a television studio. As such, it is not completely a coincidence that we are meeting her again in this class. Several years prior to the James Fry debacle, Oprah had selected not one, but two of Wally Lamb's books as selections for her book club. As Lamb describes it, Oprah's book club had taken my life by the seat of the pants and sent me on the road. The books for which Lamb became famous are not memoirs, they are fictional novels, but his sensibilities regarding the therapeutic potential of personal narrative are clearly aligned with those of his celebrity benefactor. Although Winfrey's medium emphasizes talking and Lamb's emphasizes the written word, Winfrey would certainly agree with Lamb's assessment of the ability of honest language to promote, quote, the power that comes with self-awareness, end quote. For some people, the writing cure may be a more effective therapeutic tool than the talking cure. A writer is able to go back and look at what she has written, to return to her words with a critical perspective, and even to revise what she has written to capture a more specific or more honest picture of the past whereas a talker usually allows one sentence to follow another without putting much thought into the overall structure of her remarks, a writer can achieve a much better perspective on the overall layout of what she has said. An episode in a memoir or a series of episodes can be seen all at once as a complete structure with a beginning, middle, and end. Writing can be scanned from a distance for patterns, themes, and motifs. A writer has possession of what she has written in a way that a talker does not. A writer can climb above what she has written in a way that might even allow her to master and transcend the memory she is writing about. Similarly, she might even be able to transcend the person she is writing about, to transform herself through the power of self-awareness, as Lamb puts it. The aim of memoir writing, then, is not simply to tell stories, but to achieve the kind of insight that comes with being able to stand back from something and see it in its complete shape. Three stories from Couldn't Keep It to Myself, Wally Lamb's collection of memoirs by inmates of a Connecticut women's prison, provide particularly vivid examples of the kinds of tools a memoir writer might use to achieve this kind of distanced perspective on their own lives. In the first story in the collection, The True Face of Earth, Nancy Whiteley's narrative moves back and forth between episodes from her childhood that revolve around the figure of her father, and episodes from later in her life that revolve around her relationships with men. By cutting abruptly between different points in her life, Whiteley's memoir is like a needle, stitching together her torn life with the thread of her writing. As the thread draws together these different parts of her life, patterns in the fabric became, become apparent that might not be perceptible if we were to look at her story through the lens of ordinary chronology. We get a kind of bird's eye view of the totality of Whiteley's life, an idea which is embedded in Whiteley's story through the metaphor of the view of Earth from an airplane. While Whiteley comes to conclude that she hadn't learned the truth about the face of Earth or anything else during those plane rides, she uses the craft of memoir as a kind of alternate aircraft that allows her to catch a glimpse of the truth of her life. Tabitha Rowley achieves a similar perspective by reflecting on the different hairstyles she has worn over the course of her life. Hair Chronicles tells Rowley's life story from her early childhood to her current incarceration, but her memoir's focus on her changing hair provides a through line that charts the history of how she became the woman she is today. The different ways she has worn her hair is a barometer of the different influences, cultural, musical, political, and personal, that have touched her, but it also expresses the manner in which she has shaped her own life and her own identity in response to those influences. Her various hairstyles record the many different roles she has played in her life, from schoolgirl to club rapper to prisoner, but they also stand as a symbol of consistency amid the change. Her hairstyle might continue to change, but the hair itself is always Rowley's, as is the style. 
Through her memoir, the different stages of her life come into resolution as phases of a single journey. Like Whiteley's airplane view or Rowley's montage of hairstyles, Barbara Parson Lane's depiction of her life as a disassembled assortment of puzzle pieces provides her with an image capable of encompassing the whole expanse of her life. While, while puzzles invite you to pick up the pieces and to think about how they might fit together, they can also be frustrating, as Lane describes. Some pieces that look like matches refuse to fit. Others are bent or misplaced. Some pieces are lost forever. The manner in which Lane's memoir jumps around among different parts of her life story is similar to Whiteley's technique in The True Face of Earth. But whereas Whiteley drew a specific connection between her relationship with her father and her relationships with her sexual partners, Lane's memoir is much more scattered. The entire memoir is rooted in her day-to-day -day experiences of being incarcerated, but it also roams throughout the rest of Lane's chaotic life, from her sexual abuse at the hands of her grandfather, her mother's paranoid schizophrenia and suicide, her husband's struggle with the same illness and his cheating and emotional abuse, and her son's funeral. Lane's memoir is an attempt to assemble enough of these pieces to create a picture that is complete enough to allow her to answer the question of how all the chaotic upheavals of her life integrate to form a single in human individual. Who am I then? She asks. I am Barbara Lane, who was a healthcare worker, business manager, wife, mother, homemaker, gardener, and killer, and who is an inmate. Pieces of her puzzle might be missing, mismatched, or tattered beyond recognition, but like the Mona Lisa collage on the front of the book, the fragments work together to evoke a single impression. These memoirs exemplify the power of personal narrative to act as a tool for self-understanding. In these memoirs, techniques of storytelling, the theme of airplanes in Whiteley's story, the motif of hair in Rowley's, and the metaphor of puzzle pieces in Lane's, become mirrors that allow the writers to see their own lives and to understand themselves in new and therapeutic ways.